Thank you for uh, inviting me. I mean, uh, you know, uh, some, some people in my seminar said if I would talk about uh, this retrospective I had, and specifically they said if I would talk about what I learned in my retrospective. So this, this artist talk is kind of pedagogical in that way about like what did I learn in my retrospective. And, um, and it's gonna be really long, I'm really sorry. I, I really don't believe in lectures that are over 50 minutes. And that's why I started lecturing about my work around 2004, but this is forcing me to start the work at 1991. And I tried to trim it, and I'm gonna speak really fast, and um, try to control it this way. So this uh, retrospective uh, started when Dean De Durko, the curator, one of the curators at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, um, gave me a studio visit in uh, 2014 in December, which I had this uh, spidey sense that was gonna be really important, and he did that curator thing that you are all going to experience where they say they're coming, and you have to cancel your day job or whatever, and you're waiting, and they're like, I got the address wrong, and you just wanna kill them, but it was like, mm, I'm just gonna invite it. And then he came and he said, I wanna do a retrospective. I was like, oh, cool. So, uh, like, the art world is very fickle, and you're like, well, whatever, you and what army? But uh, eventually, in January, he bought me a ticket to go to Houston. I saw the space, and we hold ourselves up in his house for two days, and I had printed miniature images of every single thing I did. We had this agreement that I wouldn't edit it at all. And I'd known Dean for a long time, so I was like, I think I could trust him. So uh, we just played cards for like 48 hours in, in his floor. And his dog would come sometimes and add a little curatorial uh, expertise. And then when I went back to my studio, I have a beautiful studio in the shores of the Gowanus Canal, perhaps you've heard of it. It's <laughs> where royalty spends time. And, uh, and I made this diagram, which was based on the conversations we had, and it was basically the blueprint for the show. And we're like, this is easy, we already know the show, now we just have to wait two years. Uh, but the, the thing is, like, we had like, the themes and the core, and it was very conceptual and really exciting. And the, really, the biggest problem we had is, if you see that line that says, stories to be told and not exhibited, is that I had made a deal with myself somewhere around 2004 that I was no longer gonna traffic in this idea of like, I made it over here, and now I'm going to do some great violence to the work to show it in a white cube. And I was like, you know, what shows in the public sphere is for the public sphere, and what shows in exhibition spaces are in exhibition spaces, and there's no need to do this back and forth translation. Like, that, that just, nobody ever wins. Uh, but suddenly, here was Dean wanting to tell the story of what I did for 25 years. And I was like, I can't tell the story of who you are if we don't include this work. It's actually the better work, or the, well, he didn't say that. He actually, <laughs> but he would, I, I, I thought that. I was like, it's the good work. Uh, and we didn't know how to do it, and we then spent basically two and a half years trying to figure out how to do that. And in the end, I don't know if it worked. Um, we spent a lot of time with scale models, and he would come on a regular basis, and we would like move things around and try to figure them out, and taking work in, putting work back out. Um, oh, I don't have to turn around because it's here. Um, and then it finally gelled, and we said we're going to have about a third of the work is going to be about things, you know, the kind of work that you look and think, and it's about this and that. And a third of the work was about work that you can participate in the space so you get to have an experience in the space. In a third of the work, we were going to show work that was experiential for participants in the past, but you can no longer participate in, in it. And we thought, we will put all that inactive work along a line of tables that would go through the entire length of the show. And this would be like the inactive work, and you would know it's like it's on a table, it's a straight line, it's not even clear if it's art or just kind of leftovers from the work. So that was our master plan. And then, of course, we spend uh, time, so this is the other view of the tables going in the other direction, and thinking about things like points of view, and people walk in, and they see something wonderful, and they'll look at it this way, and, and uh, well, maybe it'll look like this. And look, this is how it looks. It actually looks a lot like the model, which is kind of amazing. Uh, so I recommend you always make models. Uh, something that I've learned really slowly, and then you put your iPhone inside to simulate eye level view and you move it around, and it's super useful. So that's it, that's the lecture, that's the retrospective, that's how it happened. It's all about my work and how it all fits together. 
But there's another diagram that you could consider about what a retrospective is about, and it starts here. Like, I'm an undergraduate from 1983 to 1987, and then I'm too scared to go out and be an artist, so I go straight to grad school uh, from 87 to 89, and not even very far, just across the street, and I go to RISD where I get an MFA in painting. And this is another underlying structure to talk about the work. Um, Brown led to Abbott Stranahan, who I dated, and I was super in love with her. Oh my god, she totally broke my heart. And after RISD, I moved to New York, and I was going to get a job. I did get a job as a guard at the Met. And it didn't start until the end of the summer. So all summer I was unemployed. I spent time at the Strand reading books and enjoying their air conditioning. And, um, and then Abby calls me, and she's like, I got this job at the Brooklyn Arts Council as the assistant curator. And, um, I don't want to. I got a better job at the kitchen. It's so embarrassing. It starts tomorrow. I'm going to send you, and then I'm just going to tell them that you can take over the job, and I'll save myself this embarrassment. And then I did it. I just showed up with her, and she like totally negotiated. And I never went to the Met, and I was assistant curator at the Brooklyn Arts Council, where very promptly the real curator quit in disgust. And everybody's like, what are we going to do now? Who's going to take this job? And I was like, me. So then, in 1989, a few months after I got my MFA, I became the creator of the Brooklyn Arts Council downtown branch. Um, and it was all glory. They paid us, they paid me $14,000 a year. We had a, a viewer average of one viewer a day. And, uh, and it was uh, where Metrotech now stands. They raised all of that and built Metrotech. But at the time, it was a great thing. I get Glenn Live on his first show in 1990. Uh, and I got a New York Times review, so that was great. And through Glenn, I met Byron and, and all these other things. So I was really seeped into the New York nonprofit world at that time. Uh, art in space, art in general, they were all small, scrappy, uh, seat of their pants places, some older than others. Um, and through that, uh, I went to school with Spencer Finch. We applied for a really small grant with Creative Time which at the time wasn't the giant public art presenter that it is, but it was actually a really political organization that was funding a lot of uh, AIDS activism, uh, artivism. And we got um, a tiny amount of money to create a project called Masterpieces Without the Director, and that was in 1991. And this is the oldest piece in the retrospective. It was an unauthorized tour of the Met that uh, we did by co-opting the Masterpieces with the Director tour. Uh, that used to be a tour that used to have in something called a cassette tape. We had these machines <laughs> called Walkman <laughs> that were about this big. And then uh, what we did is we, um, the Met still has this, I think, it's giant numbers on their masterpieces and the walking tour tells you how to walk around and go to each number and then the director tells you why you should know that it's a really, it's a masterpiece. So we stood outside the street, uh, steps of the Met with reproductions of the masterpieces. And as people would come out of the Met, we'd be like, excuse me, did you see this? And then we had like a, you know, a little thing, and we would record people's opinion of why they liked it. And then uh, we went back to the studio, and we recorded a new audio tour that maintained Philip de Montebello's spoken instructions on how to get from one place to the other. But the description of the work was now uh, a kind of based on interviews from people and in their voices. So people were just saying like, I like that painting because it has a cat, you know, or something like that. <laughs> and, um, so it was a variety of opinions. Some were like Arthur Dante was one of the people we interviewed and he had like really funny things to say about the artworks. And then um, we almost got sued by the Met, which was uh, <laughs> a funny story that we'll have to wait. And then we put them in these cans with limited edition based on a on a brand of stewed tomatoes that we liked called the Mona Lisa brand. And inside the cans, you could get uh, the book that we produced that showed you the map, a cassette tape, and then your self-guided thing. And then we stood on the steps of the map for one day, and you could give, the, give us your driver's license, and then you could take the thing and guide yourself, or you could buy the can, I think it was like for $20. And then um, it was, we made a fortune. We made a fortune. We bought lofts in Soho after this. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing, though, is that I made this work, and then I, I never followed up on this work until almost 10 years later. It was like it was 
like I just couldn't. I was so trained as a studio artist that that this thing and, and its mini success for like six hours, I just didn't know what to do with it or the politics of it or anything. So it's funny that I totally didn't think of this project at all until the curator was like, we're going to start with this. This will hold the show together. So this immersion into this world in New York of the late 80s and early 90s in the nonprofit world led to me uh, meeting Bill Arning. And I met Bill Arning in 1990, and he was a director and curator of White Columns, which was very the usual thing. Like, White Columns was run by Bill Arning and Ellen Tenio. That was it, you know? And like, they had like each three titles each, you know? Uh, exhibitions manager, fundraising, and host, and he was director and curator and something else. And Bill Arning was infamous because he would chart the subway lines, and he would spend months going like, this stop, every artist that lives around that stop. Next stop, every artist. And so you could get a studio visit with Bill Arning in, in, at this time period, no matter almost what kind of artist you were. He just like booked you and, you, and, you, and you'd be like, I'll be there in eight months. And you just got yourself ready for the Bill Arning studio visit. And the Bill Arning studio visit led to my first studio visit ever, maybe 1991, I can't remember. And then my first one person show at White Collins in 92. Um, and then I gave back, like he made me a board member and I served for many years uh, in that capacity. And then Bill became the director of the VR uh, List Center in Cambridge. And then after that, he became the director of the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston and he greenlighted the show. So it's really interesting to see how deep those roots go. And, um, and that was around 1993 when I made this piece. This piece is called uh, His Truth is Marching On, and at the time, it was one of my first pieces where I'm like, I want the public to participate. And each bottle is a note, so it's not an instrument. It's actually uh, a karaoke machine. It can only play one song. Each bottle is filled with the right amount of water to play one of the notes of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which I was interested in because of this uh, historical nature of this song, right? It's, it's religious music, then it's anti-slavery music, then it's the Battle Hymn of the North, then the North wins at the Battle Hymn of the Republic, then later it becomes a Union song. When you approach the song, there's a, the piece, there's a mallet, then you kind of understand that you must take the mallet and you play it, and Battle Hymn of the Republic comes out. It was shown first at the Jack Tilton Gallery on the first show Tilton showed in Soho. So this was when the migration to Soho was uh, reaching its apex. So he moved from uh, 57th Street or something like that, uh, from the old Betty Parsons Gallery to Soho, and the inaugural show was Fred Tomaselli, headliner, playing Paul Rivera's in the project room. <laughs> and what's interesting is that Fred and I met at the Jack Tilton Gallery in 91, when Jack Tilton was like, you know, there's artists in Brooklyn so I know this sounds amazing, but you couldn't even get a studio visit if your studio wasn't in Brooklyn. People were like, I don't go to Brooklyn. So uh, he had this vision that he would have a show just called Brooklyn, because it was so, uh, ah, you know, and these were the artists. So notice that some people you, you know, right, and some people you don't. So, and also it's like a hodgepodge, it's like Willie Birch, you know. Um, so it was an interesting time, things were really fluid. In any case, so Bill went to CAM, but I want to remind you that uh, I was an undergraduate from 83 to 87 at Brown, where my roommate my senior year was Devin DeQ, uh, who's from Denver, and she bought Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was really a great show of support at the time. That, like, I, not only did I show the piece, then someone bought it. That it made the galleries be like, hey, maybe there's something to this guy. So when we were installing the piece, a few months ago, a month ago at camp, uh, Devon sent a singing telegram to the museum. And, uh, and we're like, what? And this woman just showed up and, let's see. Oh, no, technical failure, hold on. Oh, I've never done it this way. Yeah.
she sang the whole song. But it's amazing to think that Devon, 30 years later, still had the presence of mind to hire a singing telegram person to come to the show. I, I, I was totally blown away. So those are the undergraduate years. Uh, my drug years, as I like to call them. There's something that I really don't remember, but this person's really important. Somehow, in the early 90s, I met Jack Risley, who was a young artist who had gone to uh, Yale, but he's older than me. And he got me my first artist lecture, and he asked me to come lecture at his Cooper class. And then he liked the lecture, and then he hired me as an adjunct at NYU, where he was teaching as well. So that was my first teaching job, and it paid $3,000 per class, which I, I laughed because I was to tell my students, I don't need to do this because I had a really high paying job as a color corrector at a, a pre-press place. And I was like, it's sort of my hobby, teaching. You know, it's like 3,000 bucks. I make that in like a week. So, um, but he also introduced me to his dealer, Postmasters. So Jack is super instrumental because not only does he convince me that teaching is a cool thing to do, he also puts me in touch with Postmasters Gallery, and that's how my gallery career really takes off. Um, and that was um, sometime, 1994. And this was the show I had at Postmasters, my, my first big one-person gallery show in Soho. And I showed these kites that I made. They're all research from historical sources, people who tried to invent the airplane but failed, but still made things that could fly. They just never became airplanes that could carry people or mail or anything. And I would uh, rig them with a camera, this of course before digital photography, so it's just a cardboard disposable camera with an alarm clock. So after 10 minutes of flight, the alarm rings and as it unwinds, it hits the shutter. And it's rigged so it always takes a picture of me holding the string. So they were shown as this idea of like documentation relic, like here I'm doing an action, here's a documentation of me doing the action. Uh, it also proves that the thing can fly. So I had about seven or eight of these in the gallery, each one with photos. And this was really like this, this first peak in my art career as an artist. It's like suddenly the show went to Europe and this and that and people were buying work and I was like, <gasps> I quit my job. I was like, <laughs> from here to infinity, you know, and six months later I was like back on the street begging connections for another job. It was a disaster. But, but you know, for that's that little glimpse when you're like, I always say like when you're in your 20s, you're sort of a jerk. Um, it's inevitable. And also on the other room of the gallery, I showed this piece that actually started in 1990 and actually Bill Arning bought the prototype for $100. Uh, but it was a piece called Man on the Moon and I, I worked on it all the way to 98. And it was this idea again, as you can see a theme of liking scores and interpreting things at scores. I looked at Edison's drawing of the first recording machine and I thought, what if I took this as a score and I went to my studio and based on this drawing, I tried to basically rediscover or re-experience the discovery of recorded sound. So I made this, um, which works. It's a homemade wax cylinder. This is my homemade microphone made from a drum from Chinatown and you know, like, the sound makes the leather vibrate, makes the needle vibrate, and if you're hand cranking the wax cylinder, it scores it and records sound. And I very diligently started to dub uh, archival tapes from NASA that documented the entire time men were on the moon during Apollo 11, so that's why it's called Men on the Moon. So each cylinder holds about 60 seconds of sound in its index, so this one has from July 20th, 19 hours, 26 minutes, 40 seconds, 1969, to July 20th, 20 hours, 19 minutes, 27 minutes, 40 seconds, 1969. So this was a work that already had all these research elements that I liked, like I had to contact NASA, I had to like beg the librarian, I had to pay him money to make dubs for me. Um, it was like a really, I always did all this research and before the internet I used to go to the New York Public Library. And the same way that now you're like, oh, I Googled all day instead of working. I used to go to early in the morning to the New York Public Library and then until closing time, it's like I blew another studio day at the New York Public Library. And then they grow into these libraries, right? Because it's only a, a minute per cylinder and they were there 23 hours. So, um, and here it is, uh, one section of it installed at the museum uh, now. And we put the machine in a vitrine because it's a museum so you can't touch anything. <laughs> So yeah, that was Jack. 
Jack was really, um, I actually went and visited Jack after the open because he lives in Texas now with his wife, Amy. And I was like, he's really like a, one of these people that changes your life. Um, Jack leads to Amy Haft, his wife, who was teaching at Tyler. And um, she was taking a sabbatical. She needed a sabbatical replacement. And because she's married to Jack and they tend to talk to each other because they're married, uh, he was like, you know, that guy, Paul Ramirez Jones, is a really good teacher. And I know he's really uh, super young, but I think he could be your sabbatical replacement. So Tyler was the first full-time teaching job. It was kind of amazing. And they threw me to teach a, a freshman sculpture class. And on my first day of the job, I was like, this is the first. It was like the first day of the semester for these freshmen. And I was going to teach them sculpture and how to use the tool shop. And I was like, this is their first college class. It's like a morning class on the first day. And I was like, oh, I'm scared. But what's interesting is that there, there was this guy, Pat Caloran, who is a lifelong friend now. And I met him in 95. And he has to be my TA because he couldn't take any of my classes. So it was interesting that this friendship was born there. And he was really into public art. And he would just talk my ear off about public art. And I was like, public art's for losers. And he was like, no, public art, public art, public art this. And, um, and Pat lived in this big house, and I met all his friends, and this guy, Dean, was his roommate. So that was kind of interesting. That was 1995. Around that time, I made this piece that's also in the show. All these pieces are in the show, by the way. So uh, this is called Magellan's Itinerary, or Reproduction. I was thinking a lot about scores and action, and the artist does the action, and you present the action of the artist. But then I was like, well, what about just a score? And the action hasn't happened. So I read all uh, Magellan, some a crewman in Magellan's expedition when they went around the globe, kept a diary. And then I, I plotted where they did landfall, which was only about eight places in three and a half years. And then I called a travel agent, Spencer Finch's mom, and I said, I need to fly to these eight places in order. And she was like, okay. And she made me a six page reservation, right? Because some of them are tiny places and you have to fly them, then you have to backtrack to a hub to get a connection, to go to another smaller place, to go. So it's like this crazy flight pattern that if you were to buy it, you could reenact through commercial flights um, Magellan's expedition around the world. And she was super nice. And she made the reservation for Magellan Ferdinand, which I really like that. <laughs> So, yeah, Pat and Tyler. Where does that go next? It goes to Dean, his roommate. His roommate moved to New York and started something called Parlor Projects. It was in Greenpoint. It was just his living room. And he just had these shows, one show after the other. And he was an unbelievable curator, even though he was super young. He only has an undergraduate degree and uh, never went to study curatorial studies or anything. But he was just blasting these shows. People were going to, from his shows to the Whitney Biennial. It was sort of uncanny. And because Bill Arning also has, uh, Bill Arning doesn't even have a degree in art. I think he has a degree in English. And he used to have a band that, you, the big claim to fame of Bill was that his band used to open for Duran Duran. And <laughs> Bill is now a museum director. So I think only Bill would hire someone like Dean, who's like last of a generation of totally untrained curators. So Bill gave Dean a job as curator at CAM. And, um, and he did a couple of group shows. And uh, Bill was like, I think next you should do a one-person show. So he chose me. Also, I got Dean initially when he was really broke, a job with Janine and Tony that I met in grad school. So there's also this weird connection. Uh, and this was a really tight group. Like Janine, Byron, and Glenn were all in the 93 Biennial. I'm sure you've read about it. And it was like this very tight knit group of artists. It was all about identity politics. But I didn't fit into that group at all. Even though that was my group of friends, I just didn't make work that fit into that discourse. So I was sort of, those were my friends, but I was out. Um, so I would see them all being more and more and more group shows or just like recombinations of the same names. And I was doing my own weird thing. But I really form a great friendship with Lisa Siegel, the painter, who's married to Byron. And, um, and we collaborated, and we started this dialogue that lasted 10 years. Um, and now it's about 2001, and it's around that time, uh, right after a residence in Florida with Lisa, that I went on this project about climbing the tallest uh, 
site in every state of the union. So as you can see, I'm very interested in things like scores, but I'm also very interested in the idea that we really can't be creative, perhaps, you know, the postmodern condition. So it's like, all I do is reenactments, recreations. And I started thinking, we can't even do discovery in the geographic sense, but we can climb mountains, but we're literally following someone else's footsteps. And I sort of liked that that was exciting, even though you're not really doing anything innovative. I mean, literally, the path is so many people have walked on it that they've left a path on the ground. So I made an album for myself with empty figures. You know, this is Texas Guadalupe Peak and an empty date. And eventually, if I climb that mountain or high point, I take a picture and I put it in my album. So this is me on the top of Guadalupe Peak. I don't think so. <laughs> Let's check. No? Okay. It's coming from the hole. Better get plugged into. Someone's screaming and someone downstairs. Yeah. Alright. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this book this is bound as a book with posts, but then when it's shown, all the pages are displayed open. And then you can see uh, actions I have taken and actions I have not taken. So it's latent. Uh, I've climbed a few more than this, but I've stopped. It looks better unfinished, I think. Um, <laughs> some are really, really hard. Some are really, really hard. <laughs> and some are super easy, like Canvas. You just, like, <laughs> <laughs> you just drive there and get out of the car. And around that same time when I was thinking about geography in 2003, uh, I started moving away from these pieces that needed so much background story. And I, I started thinking about the sun and sunrises and geography. And I started making these lists of cities that are on every fourth meridian. So the piece just starts with this book and me looking at maps and thinking on the eighth meridian we have all these cities. And then I would choose one by merid per meridian until I kind of remap the world by choosing 90 cities. And each city is four degrees apart. And you can see the shape of the world, right? You can see like. North America and South America and Africa and Europe and Asia and Australia and the Pacific. And then finally I wrote a program and I made a little homemade computer that calculates when the sun is going to rise in all those 90 cities dynamically. So it's, it's different every day, right? That's like the seasons change. So it looks like an arrival and departure board of an airport. It's held high. You can see only 27 cities at a time. And then when the sun rises, it disappears, and it goes like And a new city comes to the bottom. This is uh, after it was installed at Pan. There's a little delay with the video, I think. Oh, man. We have to do the little back thing. Thank God there's only one bit more video. So you see it has that thing like the numbers are flowing and it's mesmerizing. It's a super depressing piece. It's like, ugh, another day somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I took great care with the name. So there's always a name you recognize. But if you eliminate north and south and you only keep east and west, then this colonial history is sort of like unfolds, right? Because you can have a Russian name and an Indian name in an English name, all in, this, in succession, right? Or a French name, uh, because of like who conquered what, when, and who got to name the landscape. Yeah, so that's where we were, uh, Byron, Lisa, and those dinners. And I lost track of how many I went to. But in one of those dinners, I met this guy, Harold Fletcher. And I think it was around 2005. And what's interesting is when I met Harold, there was still no real conscience of social practice, you know, like, um, or socially engaged art or anything like that. Uh, relational aesthetics was still crushing it, you know? And, uh, and Harold was interesting, and we just started corresponding, and, and we just kept this corresponding going till now. Um, and this, right around 2005, I started working on really long-term projects. One of them was uh, called Mikasa Sukasa, that took almost two years to make and about 10 trips to um, Tijuana and San Diego. And then it was um, really a weird time in my career because I was totally burnt out, bitter, um, super low and down on everything, jealous of everyone. 
and, and I just disillusioned with like showing in galleries. And I was like, I'm just going to throw myself into this project. So I spent 10 years taking photographs of people and their keys. So I would ask people, like, can you show me your keys? And they were like, here are my keys. They're like, can you take me to every single thing that your keys open? So they'd be like, yeah, that's the key to the water heater. And I'd be like, cool. And they'd be like, and this is the master key to all these doors. And I was like, show me every door, you know? And they'd be like, and this is the key to the supply closet. And I'm like, great. And it's like, and this key, I don't remember what it's for, but I'm afraid to throw it away. Cool, you know? And this is the key to my car, and so on and so forth. And people were really generous, and this would take a couple of days. And I just thought about that, that generosity, that people are willing to, to take me everywhere. Um, and I made this drawing, and I made, engraved it onto blank keys. And I made this other drawing, and I engraved it on the other side of the key. And then I had blanks made of all the most common keys in the border region of Tijuana and San Diego. And then I started giving these animated lectures, which were about all these subjects and their keys. And I'd be like, this is the key to this, and it's the key to that. And because people in the border region are always crossing the border. It's like, and then I go and wash my car in Tijuana, and then you like follow them there. Or it's like, my grandmother lives in San Diego. So every time I cross the border, I would digress from the lecture and talk about like, how do we open and close a door? What is a door? What defines open and closed? And so I would talk about stamps, you know, or I would talk about your accent or passports or the color of your skin. And I would interpret all those as keys that can keep you out or allow you in. And every time I would show an aerial picture of the border uh, between Tijuana and San Diego. Long story. At the end of the lecture, I would uh, have this little setup and I would tell everyone, hey, if you give me, I'm going to give you someone the key to my house. So I made a copy of the key to my house. And I said, you, anyone here can have a key to my house if you let me have any key from your keychain and I will make a copy and I will offer it to someone else in the audience. So someone would leave with my key, they would let me copy their key and then someone else would leave with their key. And then at the end of the evening, the last person gave me their key, right, because it's like a round robin, and I would end up with one key. And I did the lecture 14 times. So I did it in a prison, I did a bird watcher's club, I did an architecture school on both sides of the border. And it was really one of the first times where I was like, eh, who cares how many people see this? You know, like in the end, the solution was like, I'm gonna go and personally do this performative thing. And if only 700 or 500 people participate, I mean, how many people are enough, right? Like, that's a good number, and everyone gets one thing, and I get one thing too, and I don't have to speculate what the experience was like because I was right there. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, or whatever, this is the breaks. This is how it's shown in the retrospective. It's the only thing that's left of the piece, right? It's like a little explication that the copy machine, all the keys I got, and the keys to my house. So, Let's move to teaching. The thing about that Tyler job is that then made me more qualified. And then I went on to more and more jobs, to RISD, to NYU, to Columbia for three years, then to Cal Arts for a brief stint, the museum school, and then finally had enough experience that I got a tenure track job at BARD, full-time health benefits, a check that comes through the summer, and a big winter break. And that piece that I made in Tijuana and San Diego would not be possible without that kind of stability. Because that's the only reason why I could be like, screw it, I'm going to spend two years making a piece that like 500 people are going to see. Um, because I really basically had this teaching backbone to keep me together. And also what teaching did at this level was that I started teaching classes about all these things that I've been thinking about. And I started to write, I started to read again, I started to make classes that I had academic freedom. So it wasn't like, Paul, you gotta teach shop one, or Paul, you gotta teach the physical computing class. It was like, you can teach whatever you want. So it'd be like, I'm gonna teach a class on the public sphere, or I taught a class with an architect about um, the historical evolution of the, of, the, um, of the shanty town. So we talked about shanty towns in the 19th century in Paris and London, and then we compared them to Lagos and, you know, and Rio. And so it was just suddenly this moment where I was like, I'm not just some dumb artist in my studio. Like, I can think and write and have my own ideas. And I have money. So that was great. <laughs> and also at that time, I made this piece called Taylor Square. Uh, how are we doing with time? Are we still okay? All right. 
So Taylor Square was my first, uh, that's not true. I have a terrible permanent work of public art in New York City that I will never tell anyone what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really my first permanent work of public art. And it was for the city of Cambridge. And it's a really complicated story. Needless to say, or what I need to say is that I slowly had developed this ability to work in the public sphere that is not here, um, which were projects I did mostly in Europe. And I realized I just had this ability to work with like institutions and city government and kind of be a peacemaker. And I, I didn't know I had those skills. I certainly wasn't trained as an artist to have those skills. And uh, I landed this commission, and the commission was really complicated. It had to do with historical preservation and tax dollars and making a permanent work of art. And finally, the solution I came up with was to take a tiny piece of the site that wasn't historical, that's why it was in disrepair, and say, I'm going to put my artwork there. And everyone was like, oh, thank God. Now we can spend the taxpayers' money on something. So uh, I made this work, Taylor Square. It's super generic. Uh, the Department of Transportation said, oh, we want to put these sidewalks here, but you want your artwork here. And I was like, just put the sidewalks. If you pay for them, no problem. And they're like, okay. Then the firemen, because it was a historic firehouse, they're like, we wanted to put a flagpole there. Like, you can put a flagpole in my artwork. So they put this giant flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> And I basically, uh, mostly what I did is negotiate with the parks department so they would actually make this an official park. So this is the smallest park in the Cambridge park system, which means they maintain it, which is really a tough thing with public art because we spend millions of dollars in public art and then it just falls apart because there's no money for maintenance. But I was like, this needs to be part of the park system. So the park system goes there and maintains it. Uh, I had this fence that I order from the people who make fences for the park department. And they're like, you're the artist. What's your artistic design? And I was like, yeah, what do you normally do? And they're like, we normally do this. I was like, that's nice. So, <laughs> so they did it. You know, they made the fence. They designed it themselves. And then I had these doors put in. And I spent all the money working with a locksmith to make locks that are always closed from the outside, always open from the inside. So you can reach out and open if you don't have a key. And then I spent all the money making 5,000 of these. Uh, it says Taylor Square on one side and copy me on the other, which is the reverse imperative. And then I stuck it to a poster that I made right there. And on the other side, there was a letter. It says, here is your key. It is one of 5,000 keys that opens Taylor Square, Cambridge's newest park. The park and the keys are a work of public art that I made for you. The park has barely enough room for a bench and a flagpole, Please accept this key as its monument. Add it to your keychain along with the keys that open your home, vehicle, or workplace. You now have a key to a space that has always been yours. Copy it and give it away to neighbors, friends, and visitors. Your sharing will keep the park truly open. And very important for me, these letters went from my home address to 5,000 citizens' home address. There was no institutional marking. It just had to be like this thing that you get in the mail from Paul Ramirez in Brooklyn with this letter and a key, and that's it. And the monument lives here, right, in people's keychains. This is that same period. I made this concurrent with Mikasa Sukasa while working at Bard. And at the end of this, I was like, I don't know how. I, I make a lot of work before this. I made like a crazy amount of work. Uh, and after this, I was like, I think this is the best thing I've ever done. I'm never going to get a show with it. I'm never going to get a review. I'm not going to be able to sell it in the art world or the art market. Um, I can't do anything with this, right? But I felt like this is, this is good. So it really just totally, those two pieces changed my practice. I was like, I, I can't just make, 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 make. And, uh, and I really need to figure out what do I do with this kind of work. Uh, this is how it's shown at the showing Houston now. We're showing some of the envelopes that I used that returned, the two sides of the letter, the keys, a photo of the park, a little explication, and taped on the floor the actual measurement of the park. You can see how small it is. Um, so I decided to, this is when I decided to split. I'm like, I'm gonna keep making work in the public and I'm gonna keep making work in exhibition spaces. The exhibition platform is a public platform I'm just not going to be doing these translations. So I used to say, don't put paintings in the park, don't put demonstrations in the gallery. You know, it's like, 
they're very specific things for very specific public situations, don't get confused until the show happened. <laughs> so yeah, Bard leads to Hunter. Because who wants to commute two hours every week? <laughs> I didn't want to die in the Taconic. So uh, I started at Hunter in 2007. It brought more stability. Uh, also, like I could go to my studio more. Grad students, I didn't have grad students at bar. You can't imagine what that was like. It was great, but it was also like, at some point you're like, ah, 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 I, wanna, I wanna talk to someone who knows more than me. So that was pretty cool. And at that time, 2007, I started to focus on how do I port these things I'm learning in the public at large, in the public sphere, back into the white cube. So it was like, well, what do viewers have? Do they have the capacity to see, they have the capacity to read. And that's when I really started using speech ads because I was like, viewers know how to look and then they look how to read labels. So, and speech ads are things that when you say out loud have an effect in the world. So I was like, okay, I can do this in exhibition spaces. Even if people don't speak out loud in the exhibition, they can feel the potential of what if they spoke out loud. So I would make like little sculptures and put them in lecterns. Um, people would see that the mic was live. They would see the words, not too many words, because people don't like to read. So it's made out of unfired clay, and what you could read was, do you solemnly swear that you will tell, consider all the evidence in this case, follow instructions given to you, deliberate fairly and impartially, and reach a verdict, so help you God. So I started using oaths, and everyone knows that. Like, if I just read it, it's not in effect. If I read it out loud, so the best one is the one that swears that you will give a true testimony. Um, the next year, in 2008, I started using magic spells. Um, so I used abracadabra, which translated into English is I create as I speak. It's an Aramaic word. Uh, it exists in most languages as abracadabra and has a translation. So every time I show it in a different country, I remake the piece with the translation of abracadabra in that language. So it looks like a full moon. When you get closer and closer, you notice it's completely made of words. And when you get really close, you realize that it's just that incantation over and over and over again. I create as I speak, I create as I speak, I create as I speak. And the letter M makes blacks, spaces make whites, and the periods make grays. And with that, you can modulate an image. And of course, it's presented to you for potential um, reading. So 2008, the next year, or that year, I can't remember, something happened which is like finally my, my work started to be shown in Latin America, which was like a long time coming. I'm from Honduras, and I just came here and started making art, and I was like, oh, no one there seems to care. And suddenly people were like, oh, come back, you know? <laughs> so uh, one of the big things that happened was that I was asked to show uh, in 2008 at the um, Sao Paulo Biennial. And showing in Brazil is great because they don't know how to say no. You go like, you go like I want to blow up your museum. They're like, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, that doesn't mean they're going to do it. <laughs> but they say yes to everything, which is great. So um, I, I, while working at BART, there's the CCS, the BART Curatorial Program. And one of the professors at the BART Curatorial Program was Ivo Mesquita, and we wished to go out and have coffee. And then Ivo went back to Brazil, and he ended up becoming the curator of, the, of this Sao Paulo Biennial, and he called me and said, like, come on over. So I flew over, and I walked around, and I saw this, which is the keyhole to the front door of the museum. And this is the key to the door of the museum. And these are the stairways, the ramps, there's no steps in the entire museum, that take you between the three exhibition spaces, the three floors, and my piece was on the corner. It was called Talisman, my key, your key, our key. It was really popular, people would stand in line, then they would come, and if they allowed the key maker to make a copy of their key, any key they wanted, they would put it on the wall and take out a specially designed blank, and then they would copy the key to the front door of the museum. There it is. And then they would ask you, could you please sign this waiver, uh, which was a communal waiver, which was a disclaimer saying, if you come to the museum using your key after hours, you will check your bag if it's really big. If you bring children, you're responsible for them. If you, uh, you're not gonna go around yelling your own political views, please keep them to yourself. Don't smoke, don't spit. Um, don't bring liquids. 
uh, stay on the first floor. Uh, and it was just like the legal department just gave me a list of things that they're like, the curator said yes, but we say maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and then I said, well, can, can it be a communal contract? They're like, we don't care. I'm like, can I write commentary? They're like, we don't care. Just make sure that your comments are distinct from, from what they're signing. And then so I made the document into a big feature of the piece with like a preamble that was stolen from the United Nations Charter, a conclusion that came from uh, the Brazilian Constitution and this Talmudic commentary about the limitations of the piece that were being imposed in by the legal department, right? Uh -huh. And also really important for me that when people sign to participate, they see themselves as a group, that they're participating with others. And once they do that, they get the key. And they can go into the museum whenever they want. Except the key, the museum is in a park that closes from midnight to 5 AM. <laughs> <laughs> but the museum is not open that whole time. So presumably, people could come at 9 PM and go into the museum. These were the two sides of the key, a thing I stole from a print by Goya. Uh, detail and the ramps of the museum so people know when it opens. And a year later, I sinned because you're all sinners. Because we all do it. We're like, this is so pure. Now let's make it art, right? And I framed the contracts because I thought they were so amazing. And I, didn't, I really thought they were going to be disposable, just part of the participation. But then I thought, this is what art is, right? It's an agreement that we're all making. So I signed it, the two curators signed it, the director signed it, and all the participants. And this contract is the social contract of art. That you're going to make art, that curators are going to show it, that presenters are going to fundraise money for those curators to show you, and then that people are going to show up, right? That's it. So I was like, I can't throw these away or put them in a drawer. So Bart and Hunter. Remember Harold Fletcher? He's still there. And I don't know when, two or three years after I met him, he started the Portland State University MFA in Social Practice, which is a tiny, tiny MFA program that has like this huge ripple effect. People think it's like, it's taking over the world, but it's so scrappy. And, uh, and by then, I, he, like, Social practice people start to perceive what I was doing as social practice. I didn't actually, frankly, I didn't know about social practice. So uh, they asked me to come and speak there, and I start to adjunct long distance from here, there, because I thought what they were doing was cool. And that's when my work finally started to find its own discourse, which before was just like these shots in the dark. Um, at that time, in 2010, I made the only piece I've ever made in Honduras. This was the uh, graphic campaign that advertised the project. And we also had radio ads, it's media blitz. Um, and basically, Honduras is a place without history, practically, without written history. It has more governments than years of independence. So when you're a kid, they teach you independence. No, they teach you the Spaniards arrive, they kill everyone, the colony. Then they teach you about independence. Then we had a civil war very similar to yours. But why wait? We did right after independence. and. Uh, <laughs> And we killed, our, our Abraham Lincoln was our Washington, so like the guy who fought for the Union was also the guy who fought for the independence, and, but our North lost. So we executed, we executed our Lincoln slash Washington at the end of that civil war. <laughs> Very sad. Then we went to total chaos until pretty much when I was in high school, when democracy returned. It was, it was just like one government after another, one government after another. So why write it? It's so complicated. So I had an event for 24 hours, and I had this radio ad saying, for 24 hours, come to the Cinematech. Everyone can dictate whatever they remember about the history of Honduras. And at the end of the day, we'll have the whole thing. <laughs> and, then, um, and then there was like a little disclaimer that said, some events might not be remembered by anyone, or some events might be remembered by people differently. So you know, there was, we have a gallows humor in Honduras, so people were into it. It was fairly successful. People came. I had caterers come every couple of hours. Uh, I had musicians. I had like a cartoon artist, so there wouldn't be too many cameras. And, uh, and then I hired all the students of a typing academy. And then people would just come and give testimony about whatever they wanted, whatever they wanted. Uh, 
some stories are harrowing, like eight-page story about being kidnapped by the government and tortured. Uh, someone came and dictated a really formal history of feminism in Honduras. Someone came and dictated like the story of their village, including geographic names of features around the village. A little bit of everything. Um, about 250 people participated. And I stole this form because you've noticed I never invent anything. It's a pre-existing form from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa. It's just a ploy for people to come and speak out loud. So there's participants, but there's also a lot of people who just come and listen because they're too shy to participate. And at the end, there's also a book of stories. It's also self-produced. There's no curator, there's no institution, there's no funding. It's just like me and an artist in Honduras emailing and we just did it. And I encourage you all to do that. It's, I think, one of the best pieces I've ever made. And it's only for these people. I mean, the crisis of the retrospective was like, we want to show this. And it's like, this doesn't concern you. This is made for people in Honduras and specifically for the people who came and participated. You know, it's like, it's none of your business. But, you know, we want to show is the problem. Uh, I also make forms. I try to take care of lots of details. Like, you can't participate on empty paper, but it's easier to participate on a form. So this says, hey, between 30 July 1502, when Columbus came to Honduras, and tonight, well, roughly where is your story? And then people will be like, oh, it's here. Between 86 and 2008. Or in all these, uh, here, tell me, when's your story? They're like, oh, 1887. 1987. And this is how it survives now. All the transcripts, a typewriter, a short video, the poster, and the blank forms. And also translated into English, just a selection of stories for all you Anglos out there. And then also in 2010, concurrent with this piece, I made Key to the City, which is, I've gone an hour already. Oh my goodness. All right. We're almost there. It's 2010. Uh, okay. Key to the City had two aims. I'll go really fast. Uh, one, there was this, the Key to the City of New York, which is symbolic, doesn't really open anything. And I changed uh, 24 locks in all five boroughs so the Key to the City would actually open real places. And also it's decentralized, it's not just Manhattan, even Staten Island, yes. And, uh, <laughs> and there's all sorts of spaces, uh, like the Key to the City then could open this door in the Brooklyn Museum, and you could see behind the white exhibition wall to see what's behind the George Washington portrait by Peel. Uh, you could open the baptismal chamber of St. John the Divine. You could turn off this light on and off in Bryant Park. <laughs> you could open a Peel box in the Bronx. You could open the gates to the city when you walk from New Jersey through the, Verizon, the George Washington Bridge. The other thing I wanted to do was this problem. The only people who get the key to the city are famous people, and the only person who can give the key away is the mayor of New York. So I started this careful negotiation with the mayor's office, so the mayor would devolve his power so anyone can give the key to the city to anyone for whatever reason they want. We made 24,000 of these, and on the day of the opening, Mayor Bloomberg came and made this incredible proclamation. He said, this is the new key to the city of New York, and I give all my powers, and for one month, any New Yorker can award this key to whomever they want for whatever reason. I gave him the key. He was the first person to receive it, because now I had the power, and he didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you have to kiss ass. <laughs> <laughs> so he got the first key. And then it was just madness for a month. It was in Times Square. There were like these long lines of people. It was like a little kiosk where you got the key and a little passport, and you were prepped. You were told, this is an official ceremony. You will have to say these things. Please fill out the forms. You go on a red carpet. You go to this little commons, and then you do the ceremony. While people are waiting, volunteers would come and say, this is not the place where you get tickets for Broadway. <laughs> and also they would tell them things like um, people would say oh I came here to get the key and they're like oh you can't get the key you can give the key so then they would pair strangers would be like you two people came alone get to know each other figure out why you deserve it you'll give it to each other uh, this, key, this piece took like a tremendous crazy logistical amount of work 
more people participated in this piece behind the scenes than the Honduras piece, right? Port authorities, uh, priests at St. John the Divine, community gardeners, and that's something I think about a lot. It's like that an artwork can have an effect in the front with the people that it's supposedly addressing, but it's also addressing the people in the back, the people you're convincing to participate, the people who want to, that you need permission from. It's like you're also recruiting them. You're also making meaning with them. And both one side has less people than the other, but one is not more important than the other, right? And it's a, it's a way to think about making work. So people come in, there's a special plant, Danielle Webb, Hunter MFA. Uh, you open these ledgers, they're facing each other, you start to fill them out, it already puts your body in the right position, then you give the person the key and the passport, the passport tells you how to get there, the passport also you fill out so you know what to say. Please fill this form, you will read it out loud and you will still bestow the key to the city. I, blank, on this day, blank, bestow the key to the city, to blank, in consideration of, uh, do you accept this key? Then by the power template, the person has to answer, then by the power template granted to me and this work of art, I will have to award you a key. And also they're signing a disclaimer so I don't get sued. So that's always very important. Happy people with their keys. Also these people complained because they're like, this is only open when we're working. So we had special events early in the morning for workers at Times Square to come and do these massive ceremonies. And then, best moment of my career, Marilu Lem and Eucalys came and I gave her the key because she's so awesome. And because my work is basically, could not happen without her. So you should always honor your elders. From 72 to 74, she shook hands with every sanitation worker in New York City and thanked them personally for keeping the city clean in a piece called Touch Sanitation. And that, to me, was a, is a keystone of my work. It's like, how do you make art that's public and intimate simultaneously? Right. And in her case, it took the dedication of personally meeting these people. I'm more of a McDonald's person. It's like, how many people can I serve in one minute? You know? and, uh, and she just kind of traveled the city. Um, she's great. And then unexpected things that we don't have time. But when the work works, just things happen. People just start using the work in whatever they want. People start going to the P.O. Box in the Bronx and then later sending letters to future participants. This happened at all the sites, like really weird inventions, um, where people just made up stuff. On the, people just took over the piece, you know. One of the features of making work in the public is people don't care who you are. It's not authorship based. They, they, there's this thing and they want it. Like, they're not going there because it was made by, by some household name artist. Um, and often people don't even know it's art. They don't even care. They just want the key to the city and it's a meaningful experience to them. And that gives space for people to then change it and use it in a different way. This is all that's left <laughs> in Houston right now. The plinth with the ledgers and a bunch of leftover keys. Yeah, so this social practice thing just kept going. You know, then at PSU I met Jen de los Reyes who started open engagement and she asked me to do more things and I kept doing work in exhibition spaces. I'll go really fast, skip it. Monument out of core, push pins, people come. They're like, oh, I know what this is, a billboard. Boom, grows, more people, more things. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Jen Delos Reyes said, hey, why don't you give the keynote speech for open engagement? And that was really a big deal because then I took all these ideas and I gave this one hour presentation and all my peers were there and then Finally, I, I, I got a context. I had a context for my work um, where I could talk to people about my work and they were talking about their work and it wasn't competitive, it was about ideas. And that I had to wait all this time. I had to wait all this time for that to happen. Sometimes you just don't meet your people right away. And still working in exhibitions, you know? Interested in how people get together. This Gazi Stadium in Kabul, it's, um, 20,000 seat stadium, it's used for soccer and executions. And I was really interested in that, how stadiums are, we get together for the best and the worst. So I decided to make it out of 20,000 admission tickets that I silk screened in the studio and made and made a collage. So it makes into panels. And then when you assemble it all together, it makes an image of Gazi Stadium and its capacity to hold 20,000 people. 
and through open engagement in that keynote speech, I both got to curate a show, Shannon Light at the Portland Art Museum, and I met Shannon Jackson, who then wrote the essay for the catalog. So that's how you end up there. At PAM, I got to do a piece I've always wanted to do, but only for four hours, where you take something from the collection that's never shown, and something from the office that is never shown, and you put them together. <laughs> <laughs> and you get this. <laughs> And when Dean saw this, he was like, we're going to put this in Houston. I'm going to get something from the Manil collection, which, of course, he couldn't get. But we did get a very 19, nice 19th century bust of Diderot. And let me see. <laughs> and there you go. Your very own little Felix Gonzalez stories. So we're near the end. Because this leads to the present. I am going to skip the last piece because I've gone for too long. So I'm going to go, I'm just going to move through the slides. It's, you know, it's called public trust, go online, find out about it. Lots of people, it happened last summer. People can make promises. We make contracts, we make it in the seal. We say, hey, sign it with your thumbprint or with your signature or prick your finger and sign it with blood. And then uh, there's the blood. And then we put it on the side and someone writes on a giant billboard. And while they're writing on a giant billboard, we make a second copy and say, this is your copy, but you have to give us your word. So there's choices on how to swear. You can swear on the Jupiter stone. You can put a money deposit. You can ring a bell and get a thank you swear. We have holy texts and then your promise is good. People can invent their own rituals. People get a copy. People get their picture taken. Three sites, two, two, three. And then, of course, people have a drawing they take home that they signed. There's not even my name in it. That's the best part. <laughs> so um, yeah, I skipped that because we're out of time. And then it's on the table in that line of tables, except this one gets activated once a week. So the idea was that all the things on the table are participatory work from the past. You can't, don't have any access to it, but once a week you can see what a work like this is like. So every Saturday, people in Houston come, if they want to, to the museum, and they sit on this table and they participate. And the billboard is over there. So that's, that's a retrospective. But that is not this. I don't think the retrospective is this. The question, I gave this lecture because people asked me, what did you learn from your retrospective? This is not what I learned from my retrospective. This is what I learned from my retrospective. What I learned from my retrospective is that you don't do this alone. It takes a really long time. And you need friends. And you need people who are going to support you. And don't be a jerk. And don't burn bridges. And don't get angry at the person hanging the MFA show next to you. Because you don't know if 25 years later, that person is going to be a crucial person and you're going to need their help. So help each other. This is just a tiny diagram I did in like half an hour. It's not complete. All the names are not there. And so that's, that's what I learned from my retrospective. So any questions? <laughs> this is the Q&A period. These will just go on their own. Where was the last piece? Uh, the piece was in uh, Boston, in the Boston area. And we moved it because Boston is really segregated. So we couldn't find a place to put it that we could say oh, it's available to everyone. So we put it in Roxbury, Cambridge, and Copley. And we moved it in this insane thing. Every Friday night at, at dusk, we moved it and, re and we were ready to do it again by Saturday morning in a new location. So. Yes. Oh, hello. Why does public trust come to New York? Oh, uh, probably never. It's a, it's a weirdly expensive piece to do because I pay performers. And the indoor piece is cheaper. The outdoor piece was insane because of insurance and, and the Wi-Fi hub and the performers and uh, night guard and um, the scaffolding that has to be a certain permit scaffolding so the city will let you do it and blah, blah. Yeah. But maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, I was wondering um, if your teaching methodology has developed in a way that 
uh, might be reflected by how you talk about your work kind of uh, separating mm. at, that, at, at that point where you have made the keys? Really? Yeah, I think the teaching thing and the art thing is, is traditionally in the United States, you know, like in some other countries, like when you study with someone, you kind of make their work, right? Or they ignore you or, or something like that. But uh, <laughs> in the States, we try, there's even this tradition in the States that you don't show your work to your students, especially not to your undergrads, because you might influence them. And, um, but a lot of my work is trying to figure out like, how do you create a space of creativity for the participant, which is a lot like teaching beginning art. Like an art assignment, a good art assignment, right, is like a sort of constrictions that gives people guidance, but you're also kind of inciting them to rebel against those parameters. So it's like it's, it's a, a, a well-written assignment is both things at the same time, right? It's like, it's like a container, but not too containing. So. Um, I think a lot about the later work, especially like that. It's like, I need strict parameters. Uh, that's my job. But then they frame a place of freedom for the participant. And that's a pedagogical approach. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. But, but, but I'm a little worried about that because it's like, well, sometimes there's things that have happened in the classroom. Like, you know, like in seminar, I'm like, the genealogical tree. And I'm like, I think that that could be a really good piece. But then I'm like, yeah. But then, you know, I don't worry about it. It's like, it's some, that's what I'm always trying to learn. It's like, that's good for this situation, you know? It's like, uh, and it won't be good for another. So some things can be scaled up. Some things are perfect seminar size, you know? Uh, and some things are not, so, yeah. No? How to do your taxes? How to embezzle money? <laughs> From art budgets? That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you for coming then. <laughs>